Welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Young Yoo Kim. This month, both the Senate and House pushed for their respective 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, which acknowledged the U.S. commitment to South Korea of extended deterrence. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen visited South Korea, being the first U.S. cabinet member to do so after President Joe Biden's visit in May. She emphasized the allies' cooperation not only on North Korea but also on China and Russia. Today, we'll discuss these and more. Face threats from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, transnational terrorist threats. to work in lockstep to limit North Korea's continued development and proliferation of its nuclear and missile programs. In the studio with me is Van Van Diepen. Mr. Van Diepen served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation from 2009 to 2016, including over two years as Acting Assistant Secretary. Also joining me is Bruce Klingner, Senior Research Fellow for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Center. Mr. Klingner served as CIA's Deputy Division Chief for Korea. Welcome to the program. Good to have you both today. Uh, first of all, the latest National Defense Authorization Act, which was put forward both at the House and Senate, directs Department of Defense to detail the ways to how to implement U.S. commitment of uh, extended deterrence to South Korea. This seems to be in line with the earlier affirmation made by President Joe Biden when he was visiting South Korea in, uh, in May. Uh, Mr. Van Diepen, is this to show that the U.S. legislature is supportive of what has been agreed between the um, President Joe Biden and South Korean President Yoon sung yeol Sure, but I, I think more broadly, it's uh, you know just a reaffirmation of the longstanding commitment we've had to provide a so-called umbrella over South Korea uh, and to uh, you know help protect it against the, the North and, and other security threats. Uh, but given the, you know, the recent uptick in North Korean nuclear and missile activity, given the buildup of China's forces, uh, you know, reaffirming that commitment is certainly very sensible at this time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Klinger, what's your thought on this? I, I agree. It, it, to an American audience that's conversant in Korean issues, it seems to be just an affirmation of what we've been saying uh, through successive administrations. Uh, and it may be simply a way for the legislature to add their voice to that of the executive branch, or it may be in response to sort of allies are always a bit nervous when they have to rely for their secure, part of their security on another country. So it's, it's useful to always uh, reassure our allies from the executive branch, from the legislative branch of our commitment to their defense. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act also stresses the effort should be made to counter threats uh, to the security of South Korea, not only from North Korea, but also from Russia and China. Mr. Klinger, traditionally, the U.S. ROC alliance was much more focused on deterring North Korea. Is it now extended to the area covering China and Russia as well? Well, of course, the existential threat to South Korea is from the North, and that has to be the predominant security focus. Uh, but the U.S. has long been trying to urge or push our allies, both in Asia and Europe, uh, to assume larger security roles. And with uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, we've seen increasing efforts to expand their security role beyond their own national security to regional security. And Japan and Australia have, have really stepped up their game on that. South Korea has been a bit hesitant, but under new President Yoon, uh, we're seeing a pledge by him to do so. And so we'll have to see how Seoul plays that out. Mm -hmm. Mr. Van Dippen, this whole 
situation, does it show that the ever-changing security environment surrounding the Korean Peninsula is that serious? And I think a, a lot of this, you know, there's you know, recent changes in the environment, but you know, in the Cold War days, our extended deterrent guarantee also covered any attacks that might have occurred on South Korea from then the Soviet Union and, and China. Uh, but now that we're in a, an environment of you know, increased great power tension, more assertiveness by both China and, and Russia, uh, you know, clearly uh, you know, re-emphasizing the part of our deterrence that deals with that is you know, especially relevant now. Mm -hmm. And since April, uh, there were signs that North Korea could be preparing for its seventh nuclear test. And the US government has been warning about this for some time now. And we don't know exactly for sure what North Korea is thinking, but Mr. Van Dippen, what kind of a state are we at right now? Because North Korea seems to be a little bit quiet these days. What do you think? Um, well, I mean, as usual, we don't really know the North Korean perspective on all of this. You know, we don't know what their intentions are for nuclear testing, you know, when they would test, what they would test, what political and other purposes they might be pursuing when they conduct such a test if they do. Uh, but really, I think the, you know, the, the North Koreans have been working hard to make clear that they have a, you know, a fairly well-established nuclear deterrent in place. Uh, and uh, you know, making clear that they believe that that, that turn is, is credible uh, and uh, you know, helps protect them from what they claim are you know, external threats from, from the US and, mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Mr. Kleiner, because North Korea being, is now quiet, we, we shouldn't assume that this will go away, should we? No, and with both South Korea and the U.S. government saying a nuclear test could be imminent, and they've been saying that since April, uh, we're just having a, a waiting game right now. It, it's a little confusing because when they say they've completed all preparations for a nuclear test, that would mean they've put a nuclear device in the tunnel, they've packed it with the rubble they excavated, and you, you don't want to leave a device in there for a long time. It's sort of like uh, fueling a liquid uh, fueled missile. You don't want to leave it there for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but then subsequent reporting showed that they hadn't packed the tunnel. So it's a little unclear. But rather than focusing on when will they do it or the the ever you know ongoing game of why did they do it and why did they do it now, when they do it, that's the important fact. It is yet another violation of UN resolutions, a very serious violation. It will raise tension in the regions and we will have to take steps to signal our resolve as both deterrence and reassurance of our allies. So it doesn't matter whether they did it in April or May or June, as earlier predicted, or you know, some new anniversary or just some other day of the week. It, it's when they do it that things will get very tense, I think. Mm -hmm. Many North Korea watchers say that the Biden administration is caught up with China and Russia situation right now. So it, it's, it is seen as they don't have enough room to deal with North Korea. Is that true? You know, any president has a long, long list of foreign and domestic issues on his, on his to-do list. Uh, and he can't handle, you know, a thousand of them a day. Uh, but in the government, in the intelligence community, the military, the State Department, people are focused full time on North Korea. Uh, and when North Korea does something bad or good, if they were to say they're coming back to negotiations, that would quickly push it to the top of President Biden's uh, agenda for the day. In the meantime, when it is relatively quiet, then he has other issues, foreign and domestic, to, to focus on. But the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time. Mr. Van Dippen, what would you say about the where North Korea stands in the U.S. government's agenda? Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a significant part of that agenda. I mean, you know, first and foremost in the, the foreign policy world, I'm sure that we're looking most seriously at Russia and China because those are sort of pure competitor threats to the United States itself. But we fully recognize uh, the significance of North Korea, uh, you know, relative to our close ally, South Korea, Japan, uh, its impact on regional stability in a critical region. And of course, we've got U.S. forces and all sorts of U.S. interests in South Korea and Japan. Uh, so North Korea, you know, occupies a, you know, a, a prominent place on the agenda. But remember, too, day to day, what we really need to do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea is continue to deter North Korea. And that happens every day 
with what our military does, with the messaging that we send out, with what our diplomacy does, and our relationships with our allies, in our work with our allies to strengthen their military capabilities. So that goes on day after day after day, regardless of what the president may do or say on any given day. Yeah, you just talked about day-to-day -day deterrence. And recently, the United States and South Korea Air Forces conducted joint air drills featuring F-35A stealth fighters for the first time. And the South Korean Air Force said the two countries held the exercise to boost collaboration between the stealth fighters. Mr. Van Dippen, how would you interpret this kind of a show of force from the U.S. and South Korean side? It's obviously targeted at North Korea's possible nuclear test. I don't know what the exact motivations were necessarily, but I, I, in my view, I would interpret it, and if I were a North Korean, I think I would interpret it as just a you know, continuing effort by the alliance to demonstrate its resolve, its capabilities, uh, its continued cooperation in the improvement of its conventional capabilities. Uh, so making clear to North Korea that uh, it would not profit from an, engaging in any kind of aggression against the South. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kuliner, President, South Korea's President Yoon Song yeol he just called for an airtight and effective missile defense system to respond to North Korea's threats. This, this kind of uh, exercises, training between the uh, air forces of the two countries, does it help increase South Korea's capability to counter North Korea's nuclear weapons as well? Well, the, the deterring North Korea's threat is, it requires many different components in the military. So we have missile defense, we have conventional forces. Uh, those are to deal with mis incoming missiles as well as any conventional forces. So the, the agreement by the U.S. and South Korea recently to resume military exercises mm -hmm. back to pre-2018 levels uh, is to offset the degradation we've had since 2018 uh, when President Trump unilaterally said that he, he wanted to cancel these exercises mm -hmm. to the great surprise of the Department of Defense, U.S. Forces Korea, and our South Korean ally. Um, they, they weren't in return for any diplomatic or uh, military reciprocal gesture from North Korea. It was just a unilateral uh, gesture. So it, it didn't get us anything in return, and it did eventually degrade our capabilities. So uh, these military exercises and those that will come in, in August, as well as subsequent ones, are to bring us back to uh, 2018 levels of readiness. Missile defenses uh, are necessary because North Korea in the last several years has unveiled 12 or more new short and medium range systems that are more capable than their predecessors. Some may even be able to evade missile defenses that we currently have. Mm -hmm. As the Mr. Kuliner said, the U.S. and South Korea are to revive large-scale field maneuver exercises. And the South Korea Defense Ministry said the Allies will be doing a joint military exercise next month called Ulti Freedom Shield. Uh, the new exercise seems to be equivalent to the Ulti Freedom Guardian scrapped about five years ago. And um, Mr. Van Dippen, how do you see this meaning of the resumption of this kind of large-scale exercise? You know, it shows that, uh, you know, we are serious about the business of improving the alliance's conventional capabilities to improve our ability to deter mm -hmm. North Korea. Uh, and it also shows, you know, I may differ a little bit with, with Bruce on this, you know, I don't know if there was an ex explicit bargain, but in the time frame where we had suspended these large-scale exercises, the North Koreans had not tested ICBMs and had not engaged in explosive nuclear tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, you know, having five years without ICBM testing, uh, and we'll see how long without nuclear testing, you know, provide, provided concrete benefits to the security of the United States mm -hmm. in terms of degrading the reliability of that North Korean nuclear threat. But obviously the North Koreans have resumed ICBM testing. And so uh, for, at a minimum for that reason, we sh you know, it's certainly in line for us to resume large scale exercises. And of course there are good conventional forces reasons for us to do that as well as Bruce has, has indicated. Mm -hmm. um, to follow up on that, the US maintains it is open to diplomacy with North Korea. Do you think this kind of a large exercise will affect diplomacy towards North Korea? Uh, no. I mean, the North Koreans have made it clear that they've got no near-term interest in diplomacy with us. And given their, you know, their clear desire to want to retain substantial nuclear and missile capabilities, uh, 
you know, it's not clear that there's a fruitful diplomatic outcome that's, that's possible in any case. But I think that by making clear that the, the U.S. is prepared to sort of meet anytime, anywhere, you know, we've done what we can on our side of that, but it takes two to tango, and the North Koreans clearly are not interested right now. Ms. Kleiner. Well, dur during the, the last several years, we've uh, canceled, constrained, reduced military exercises. Uh, in the first year alone, after President Trump's decision, we canceled 14 uh, allied combined exercises. During all of those years, uh, North Korea did not come back to the table. Uh, they re repeatedly rejected entreaties from South Korea and the U.S. for, for talks, let alone uh, negotiations. So uh, we've not enforced our own laws against North Korea and China and Russia violators uh, of uh, money laundering laws in, in our own financial system. We haven't fully enforced U.N. sanctions. Uh, you know, we, we've degraded our capabilities. We've reached out repeatedly. We've we've offered security assurances. A long list of things that that people have called for the U.S. to do, and we've done. And they've they've re generated no interest from North Korean dialogue. So clearly, the the ball is in North Korea's court. Um, we've offered them benefits. We've given them benefits, uh, all to to no avail. Mm -hmm. Where is U.S. and South Korea? Should they keep doing what they're doing right now? Well, I, I think that one of the things that helps everyone have that relationship be managed well is the U.S. having strong relationships with its allies. And so, you know, close and strengthening U.S.-South Korea ties, uh, a, you know, increasingly strengthened deterrent credibility vis-a-vis -vis the peninsula. And in the middle of all of this, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen visited Seoul and she was uh, seen as to follow up what was discussed when President Biden was visiting in May. And she was there to discuss a variety of economic issues between the two countries. But she also mentioned North Korea as well. She said the U.S. and South Korea continue to work together to limit North Korea nuclear and missile programs. And before she arrived at South Korea, she also said the U.S. has further sanctions it could adopt against North Korea, although she didn't give out specifics. Mr. Klinger, what are the further sanctions U.S. can put on North Korea? Well, it's really more enforcement of existing legislation and laws. Uh, if you talk to the people in the U.S. government who are working on sanctions, they'll tell you and they'll have told you for the last decade or more that they have drawers full of target folders against North Korean, Chinese, and Russian entities that they could sanction today, but only if the policymakers allow them. So what happens is when North Korea does a provocative act, uh, we bring out five or so target folders from the, from the drawer, we sanction them, announce them as a stern response to a North Korean provocation. We put the rest of them back in the drawer, waiting for the next provocation. It's like the mayor of a city saying, I'm tough on crime. And when the police commissioner says, okay, sir, I could arrest 100 bank robbers today. And he said, well, I want you to boldly arrest five. And then the next time someone robs a bank, we'll arrest a few more, rather than going after all those that are violating not only UN resolutions, but our own laws. Mr. Van Dippen, US government seems to be very cautious implementing secondary sanctions on Chinese or Russian entities involving North Korea's provocations. And China and Russia are against, at least at the UN Security Council, they're against uh, putting more sanctions on North Korea. So how is it possible to put more pressure on North Korea without cooperating, without getting help from China and Russia? Well, I, I think the you know, in terms of the U.S. directly sanctioning North Korea directly, we're pretty far up on the marginal utility curve. You know, there may be some more individual entities we can add, but, you know, we've had an embargo on that country since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, so the real place where there's scope for dramatically increasing the pressure on North Korea and dramatically limiting inputs into North Korea, particularly, you know, technology inputs for their weapons programs, is the, the so-called secondary sanctions on other countries that are helping North Korea. Uh, and uh, there, a lot of those countries, not just Russia and China, but I mean, there are countries around the world, you know, through which North Korea operates, through which North Korea tries to obtain goods and technology, financing, et cetera. Uh, you know, we have other foreign policy interests with those countries that will be affected if we sanction their entities because of North Korea. Mm -hmm. So in every case, you have to just sort of make trade-offs. Well, what's more important than what? Mm -hmm. And, you know, different people have different opinions about whether the trade-offs are struck in the right place. 
Uh, but it seems to me in an environment now where we're you know, clearly in direct competition with Russia and China, we are sanctioning Russian and Chinese entities for things having to do with Russia and China. Uh, there should be fewer inhibitions on us in sanctioning Russian and Chinese entities for things having to do with North Korea as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to add something? Yeah. yeah the, for example, in 2017, the U.S. Congress sent a list of 12 Chinese banks uh, to the Trump White House. And the Congress felt that there was evidence that all 12 of those banks, including the four largest in the world, Bank of China and others, were committing money laundering crimes in the U.S. financial system on uh, U.S. soil. We took action against none of them. Uh, in the past, we imposed eight to nine billion dollars in fines on British and French banks for money laundering for Iran. We've imposed zero dollars in fines on Chinese banks for doing the same for North Korea. So we are giving China immunity from U.S. law uh, for committing crimes in the U.S. financial system. Similarly, uh, in 2018, President Trump announced there were 300 North Korean entities he was not sanctioning. Uh, or enforcing U.S. law against because we were talking so nicely to North Korea. We haven't taken action against those either. So, uh, you know, in, in, during the Bush administration, uh, the Bush administration took action against a bank in Macau. North Korea said, you finally found a way to hurt us. And the fear of additional sanctions, secondary sanctions, forced the, made, uh, the Bank of China defy the government of China and cut off North Korea from China's financial system. When we reversed that action against the, the bank, Bank of China and others went back to engaging with North Korea. So we can influence Chinese banks and businesses mm -hmm. even when the, ch the Chinese government doesn't want them to take action. Mm -hmm. But we've been holding our punches uh, for successive administrations. Mm -hmm. What was interesting about Yellen's visit was Yellen called out China for its pra uh, trade practices and she promoted what she called friend shoring to lower economic risks among allies and partners. Mr. Klingner, this is consistent with the U.S. strategy in aligning with itself with its allies? Well, there's, there's long been a push to diversify away from an over-reliance on the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the the U.S.-South Korean Free Trade Agreement has just had its 10-year anniversary. One of the strategic objectives of that was to diversify South Korea's over-reliance on Chinese trade. And back in 2004, there was the China shock in South Korea, which also led to questions about being too reliant on China. So uh, there have been efforts, and South Koreans will always tell you that well, after they agreed to deploy the THAAD ballistic missile defense system in South Korea in 2016, China retaliated against them. And what did the U.S. do? Well, it's a question of what we, what could we have done. But right now, what we need to do is help South Korea, as Australia has already done, diversify away from China. And that way, it reduces the potential for China to use economic warfare or coercion against our allies and partners uh, if they do something that Beijing doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Mr. Van Dippen, Mr. Kluner just pointed out that, and indeed they did, some South Korean critics say Janet Yellen's remarks are putting too much pressure on South Korea when it is relying a lot on China for its trade. What would you say to that? Um, I, I, don't, I guess I would not say that, that's, that's, that that is correct. Mm -hmm. I think Bruce has made a very good case that it's, you know, it's clearly in South Korea's own interest to have a more diversified supply chain and more diversified economic relationships. Uh, as the Chinese themselves have directly demonstrated their willingness to use economic coercion against South Korea, which you know, clearly is not in South Korea's interest. And as we all saw in this country with the supply chain disruptions, being too heavily dependent on any one country, even for general economic reasons, is probably not a good idea anymore. And so having a more diversified supply chain also just makes general economic sense. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in South Korea, the Justice Ministry said it concluded back in 2019 there was no legal ground to South Korea to send the two North Korean fishermen back to North Korea, which meant the previous Moon administration still went ahead with it. And many people question whether the whole truth surrounding the case has been revealed. Mr. Van Diepen and Mr. Klinger, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you for having us. Great to be here. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis.